Any, anything at this stage? Okay, we shall, we shall start up. Worries about technology aren't new. We're worrying about the internet today and ethical issues. Many people are worried about the internet precisely because of the opportunity it gives for spewing out things from the id and the lowest levels of the personality, as it were, at high speed and uh, without any consideration of what you say. Our inquiry here is whether the internet behaviours have aspects that may be considered ethical. Any sense? This is setting the scene for the day. There's no real concept of internet ethics. When I say that, it's not quite fair. There's two people in the room who have written substantially on this, but it's been a minority scholarly pursuit becoming a much more, much wider interest and serious concern. Three views on what constitutes ethics. Um, the two best-known ones traditionally are utilitarianism or consideration of consequences, which in this country we associate with James Stuart Mill, which roughly says that the best act is that which leads to the greatest good of the greatest number. There are many arguments against it because it justifies sort of you know bumping people off if. Um, if the outcome's right, and that's basically how wars are prosecuted after all. It's something that the NHS takes very seriously in the kind of calculations they do on whether or not to give you a replacement organ. They think, are they spending the money right on you, giving you a new leg, rather than giving 50 people something less radical? The second best known idea we usually associate with Kant is the notion that there, there, are, there are, in some sense, universal moral rules, and you can find out what they are. Um, Kant's formulation is the categorical imperative, so-called, can the principle behind my action be universalized? You cannot honestly say, I will that everybody should act this way. You cannot consistently will that everybody should lie, for example. And therefore, he deduces from this that truth and is good. I mean, I'm not putting this with any uh, philosophical uh, precision, but you know the idea. Murder is a clearer case. You don't do murder because you can will that no one should murder because it might apply to you. It's really a, a sort of general philosophical version of um, you know, some New Testament precept on doing unto others as they should do unto you. And of course, as George Bernard Shaw once famously said, don't do unto others as they should do unto you, because their tastes may be different. Um, there are many objections, frivolous and serious, to this. The third, I think, is in some ways the most interesting, the revival of what in recent years has been called virtue ethics. Many people associate it with Philippa Foote. Some people trace it to Aristotle. David Hume, the greatest philosopher in these islands, um, certainly held a version of virtue ethics. That, that in some sense, the right is connected with character and and, and specific virtues and their practices are formed by character and training. You can also relate this to ethical codes like Confucianism. But there are many versions of this. It's a slightly a rag bag, but it's, it's been a more productive rag bag than the two old chestnuts at the top in recent years. Does the internet and its design have anything to do with ethics? This will come up. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, of course, a genius, was a physicist, and uh, a physicist who specialised in databases, and that's where the World Wide Web comes from. He saw it originally as a universal tool, but essentially for scientists initially, first physicists, then scientists. But behind it, as you know, there has been, if you can call it an ethics, certainly an intellectual politics behind the web from the sort of hacker, individualist, anarchic. Um, something to do with the sort of state of mind of computer researchers in the 60s, many of whom are still alive and in the W3 consortium. Um, they're the people who want to defend the death of net neutrality, um, putting anything right on the web, no matter what the consequences. In some sense, the people who design these technologies are in fact expressing norms in their design. And one of the things some people today want to discuss is whether the internet has design principles inside it that, as it were, express ethical content. I love this quote from Zadie Smith on, um, it's, she didn't use the phrase norm entrepreneurs, it's a phrase that some colleagues here have used. She, as a novelist, stood back and looked at how Zuckerberg and people appeared to act, at least in the movie, and what we know of their personal histories. In some sense, we're all having Zuckerberg's personality pushed at us. It's what a sort of techno geek age 20 would want. Lots of connection, lots of girls. Um, and that has become a sort of worldwide platform which is uh, constraining us and what we can do, given that many people in this room probably are compulsive Facebook users. I mean, it's, that is quite an interesting fact. And does that have any ethical consequences? Possibly not, but it's worth thinking about. One of our starting points is, and uh, you may not all agree with this, and it's a difficult thing to say here in the, if I'm deliberately picking it because we're here in the Royal Academy of Engineering, is about the relation of what we're talking about to codes of practice. Some people on listening to this topic say, oh, there's just codes of practice. Oh, isn't that covered? Don't they have these? Don't the Royal Academy of Engineering have codes of practice? You bet they do. You're going to see them in a minute. Um, the assumption behind that I think most of the presenters share is that codes of practice, whatever their virtues, don't quite capture what we're talking about, but they aren't irrelevant to it either. The Highway Code is one of the original codes of practice in this country, um, but it's not a censored document full of ethical content, although you could question that. There's not a complete divorce between codes of practice and ethics. Um, an observation, I don't know which of the people in the room I owe this to, it's not mine, is that laws can create moral feelings as well as 
laws being the result of moral feelings. I mean, a clear example is drunk driving in this country. Since there have been stringent laws against it, often influenced by European practice, a lot of most people now think it's immoral, as well as illegal. These are the Engineering Council's guidelines uh, of codes of conduct. They say what you think they're going to say, and they're very sensible. They're absolutely excellent. They're not very different from the British Computer Society's list of guidelines. But the question you'll, I'd want you to think about during the day, and the team wants you to think about, is I mean, how far do guidelines like this really constrain behaviour? Or are they the sort of codes of practice and ethical assessments that everybody ticks before they do research, but actually nobody believes in a bit? I'm not saying that's my view, but I, I do think that the people who make up these guidelines overrate their, their power, their force. Codes of practice, of course, can be ethical. You mustn't take me as saying there's no connection between ethics and codes of practice. I mean, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, first do no harm. That's a code of practice, all right. All doctors have still, I think, have to swear the Hippocratic Oath. This is what Hippocrates said. It's definitely a moral injunction. Uh, journalists traditionally refuse to name sources. Um, lots of this stuff is about not being sued. Ethics shouldn't be about not being sued, and so often it is. Uh, any questions at this stage on how we carry on? There'll be lunch, there'll be coffee breaks. Okay. People have been arguing recently that um, if you uh, have cyber war, then you can have a bloodless war. After all, you are having an impact on infrastructures, you're not killing people. Just consider that if you stop the traffic lights of a whole city, uh, ambulances and, and fire brigades would not work properly, and so on. So sooner or later, you are going to affect human lives. But that is first impression, and some military out there might consider that war is something more visible because it's less immediately uh, bloody. Cyber war is not only affordable, previous point, um, but it's also more easily uh, achievable by the individual. You don't need an army to uh, put a, a whole nation on its knees. Um, that is going to be something that we're going to see more and more frequently in the future. Again, huge uh, ethical issues there. Resilience in cyber war uh, comes with some erosion of human rights. More uh, cameras, more CCTVs, more checks, more airports, uh, data shared between the US and the UK. So you think about the nuclear deterrent. We can just approve Tridents and they would not make immediately our life any more, more different than it was yesterday. We passed some legislation about cyber war that requires checks <coughs> and say ID cards and for the checks and, and so on. Your life is going to be different tomorrow. Now, where the balance lies there, that's another ethical issue that uh, is being debated as we speak. The more complex the systems we are relying on doing some kind of either cyber war or IT based conflicts are the more difficult it becomes to make sure that someone is immediately responsible. Now this for ethics is a big challenge because we have 25 centuries of ethical analysis in the philosophy department based on two documents. One, look for the individual. Two, look for the human individual. So if a company does something wrong, sooner or later someone, Peter, John, Mary, you name it, is going to be responsible ethically. If something goes wrong in the army, then someone, an individual, will have to bear the responsibility of what goes wrong. We just delegate more decisions to automatic systems. There's a point where those automatic systems uh, generate issues and backtracking responsibility for what went wrong is not that easy. Interestingly, uh, classics are classics for a reason. So you uh, read uh, Machiavelli, the prince, and you discover that some of the problems we're dealing with today are in a different format address there. First, if the prince wants to conquer Afghanistan, quote unquote, he has to go and live there. That is the level of commitment that will convince the population in Afghanistan that the prince is serious. He doesn't go to live there, they won't believe that he will stay forever. They will just wait long enough until he moves. And the second point, again, for Machiavelli, uh, is uh, mercenaries. Mercenaries are not taken seriously either. And your robots and drones uh, today are the you know, Renaissance mercenaries of good old days. The locals will not believe that uh, that level of commitment is there. So again, a cyber war fought uh, 
uh, by proxy has a huge cost, ethically speaking, in terms of decrease credibility of the commitment and therefore undermining the possible results that you might be able to achieve. Lots of Taliban were found with footage from the American predators on their laptops. They bought uh, a piece of software from Sweden for $40 and it's actually used for, for grabbing people's TV signals so you can actually watch TV on your, your computer <coughs> and they use this to tap into the drones and they've been doing this for some time well, hacking into these drones there's a big drive both in the military and in the police forces to use a common operating system and the United States is going to legislate for this because you've got all these different companies like we've got BAE systems, you've got Kinetic, you've got General Atomics and they're all using different kinds of operating systems. So the idea will be, um, let's give them all a common operating system so we can all work them from the same remote control devices and everything else. And the worry about that is, all you have to do is work out how to hack into one of these, and now you've got them all. Whereas I'm really encouraging them, I'm, I'm not into development of military weapons, but I'm really encouraging them where I can when I'm speaking to stay with as many diverse operating systems as possible because this is very dangerous territory. It, I believe myself that it won't be long before terrorists hack into a, an armed drone and use it to attack us. I don't actually feel that you are anonymous online. Just as the masks in the examples that were in the video there uh, were awful, really frankly awful. Who is a Lone Ranger? Oh, it's Bob. Bob is the guy wearing the silly mask. Or who is Superman? Oh, it's it's Clark Kent. Clearly, he's just he's just wearing glasses at the minute. They're really, really apparent, really clear, really obvious. So is the very, very thin facade of the anonymity of the web. So not only technologically are you not anonymous, um, but also socially you tend not to be anonymous. Does the fact that you can have a mask mean that you will devolve into some kind of horrendous rabble and, and Create, create these, these communities and these environments. Increasingly, um, we're recognizing that communities that have people who interact over time again and again, um, have hierarchies, have emergent governance, and these are all based upon the existence of an identity, a persistent identity. So that's one aspect that I wanted to talk about. The second element was also raised in your videos, the power in numbers, the I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. The, this notion of anonymity in numbers. Uh, I recently did an interview with Moot, Chris Poole, who is the very young creator of uh, an online um, message board called 4chan, in which people share images. It's a very easy way for people to pass images around. It started out um, as a, a, an English language version of a Japanese site. What happened was that it very quickly devolved into um, one of the most toxic places online in which many of the memes, many of the sort of the viral things that are very popular in the kind of culture that make the culture of the web have emerged. They were popularized um, on 4chan. At the same time, it's also known as, a, as an environment that's full of trolls, that's full of people who you know, are quite negative and who commit things like uh, DDoS attacks. Particularly because this environment is anonymous, Chris is very passionate about the idea that it remains anonymous because it does have such power. Because um, the collective that has become known as anonymous and has gathered on 4chan frequently works together in order to uh, attack or to uh, protest against things that they as a community don't agree with. So Scientology has been a quite, quite big event on the 4chan board, um, and also things like um, the Recording Industry of America. Um, anyway, that's, that's the, the aspect of the power of numbers. So I'm not going to go too much into those things at the minute. I'd like to open this up to discussion. Everyone seems to agree that privacy is, is important, um, but many people have different reasons to think why it is important, and uh, some of them are incompatible. And so many accounts of privacy, so it's, it's a little bit of a conceptual confusion and when you get into uh, practical issues to do with the web, with, with electronic patient records, those kind of confusions, conceptual models come onto the table and you, know, you have a little bit of confused debate. There's a tendency in the audience to, to divide between people who say privacy hooray versus the people who say privacy boo. 
Um, and that is a very deep divide um, that if you, you project it onto the world map and say, well, you know, uh, communitarian collectivist uh, countries or cultures uh, don't think too much of privacy and individual rights that protect privacy. Um, and uh, Western liberal states um, think it's very important and have, have written it into their um, you know, constitutions. Data protection is a European framework, a way of conceptualizing privacy, whereas the privacy is, is a, uh, you know, put things in terms of privacy is a, is a US American uh, way of, of, of looking at things. The advantage of the, the data protection approach is, is that you construe it as there is something valuable and vulnerable, which is personal data, and you want to put a fence around it, basically, and we, we, we're, we're very much used to doing that. We put a fence around, um, you know, the, we were, yesterday we were in the British Library, you know, valuable medieval manuscripts, you put a fence around it, you uh, constrain access and interaction to the thing that you think is valuable and vulnerable. In a nuclear power plant, the access is constrained because if you don't do it, you know, things will go wrong. The same kind of model applies to uh, personal data. We constrain the access to personal data because we think that things can go wrong. And now, this is the point where the philosophy or the kind of the ethics uh, enters, because now we're starting to get reasons for why we put fences around and constrain the interaction to personal data. And so you have you get a taxonomy of moral reasons why we do this. For example, harm. If we know that, um, that personal data in an information society is like ammunition or weapons, if you leave it you know, lying in the open, people will use them and um, there will you know, be accidents. Um, so the reason to constrain them, uh, access to, to personal data, first is a very solid utilitarian, kind of John Stuart Mill would have liked that. Uh, you know, the, the reason why we do that is to prevent harm. Uh, it's a very, fairly uncontroversial uh, consideration that can be shared both by collectivist communitarians and the people who are uh, kind of modern uh, liberal individualists. A second reason has to do with the fact that personal data is a commodity right? and um, if you use your loyalty card um, then you, there's a quid pro quo. You get um, something in exchange for making your information available. But do you know as an individual consumer what is going to happen with, with that data? Will it be secondary use? Will it be sold on? Will, how will it be mined? How will it be used? We have data protection regimes to protect consumers in a market for personal data. A third reason uh, has to do with um, kind of containing, and um, a colleague from the US, Helen Nissenbaum, has, has called it contextual integrity. If I share information with my doctor in the context of a clinical setting, uh, and I'm providing this information for him, for, to allow him to make me, or to enable him to make me better, uh, to think about uh, you know, therapy, um, that I would like to, um, that information to, to be contained within that context. And I'm, I'm slightly disappointed to find out if he kind of uh, sells that to a commercial pharmaceutical company to help him pay off his mortgage, right? Because now he has uh, kind of leaked into another context with a different uh, internal purpose and another goal. We'd like to see those things separated uh, and for good reasons. Also, the information is provided on the condition that it has a certain meaning within that context. And if, if, you, if you change the context, the, the information will be different. A fourth reason where we kind of import the, the, the controversy is that there is a certain conception of the self uh, underlying uh, you know, privacy debates. And the conception of the self is exactly um, the, um, the topic of dispute between liberalism and communitarianism. Because liberals think that the individual should be in charge of the writing of his own biography, of his autobiography. It's me who is, is deciding who knows what about me. I'm in charge. I'm autonomous. Um, and if you want to know something about me, you have to ask me. Whereas communitarians would say, we need to relativize that, that idea. You know, it's the, the individual um, should open up to society or to the community that he's part of. And he can only be that individual uh, if, if, he, if he shares, not only pays taxes, but also pays with information to that society. 
I still see a lot of people who are interested in keeping control over the self-image or the identity they project. Yeah. What people are interested in is that they aspire to be a certain person, right? So they, they think of that as their ideal aesthetic or moral or other self. And, and um, they would like the other people to identify them as such. I want you to identify me as the person I identify with. I want to be identified as the person uh, with this ideal of yourself. I can't directly manipulate your, your beliefs by kind of uh, uh, tempering with your brain. Uh, I need to control the information flow in order to, to make you have the right beliefs about me, or the beliefs that I would like you to have about me. I'm constantly thinking about you know, what, what is the image that I'm projecting. So somewhere um, underway we have to say, well, perhaps we're not so much interested in uh, allowing people to, con to do this, this incredible amount of control about self-presentation. We can see that they have a, a need for it and they, that they have a, uh, or, you know, a deep felt need or a, and, and a right, associated right. But at some point it becomes probably too much. So I think both uh, liberals and uh, communitarians, both individualists and collectivists, can share those kind of considerations and they can come to an agreement and have a discussion, you know, is this going to harm people? Is it unfair in a market for, um, for uh, personal information? Um, are there any transgressions across the boundaries of those spheres? And in the context of, of thinking about design solutions or uh, writing laws and policies, um, that is very difficult because you, you will never get an agreement uh, on CCTV cameras or, or design features of new systems. If people say, well, you know, I'm all for privacy or I'm all against privacy, and you, know, you have a little bit of confused debate. So is that a, is that a problem? We search more and more for more and more things every day, <laughs> and we take it for granted and at the same time, um, we don't know who is interrogating what we're searching for. If you look back on the so-called AOL debacle, things that people searched for were released in a kind of very large scale database and it was thought that these searches could not be traced because obviously they were anonymous. It, it of course took very little time figure out who the people were that had been searching for this information. And that can be done by kind of identifying where you live and what you search for and matching that up against all sorts of other data. Online spaces such as Second Life or uh, large-scale, massively multiplayer games are a really interesting example of anonymity, privacy, and how those can be compromised. Some researchers have gotten access to massive databases for figuring out who's doing what where, who's playing with whom, how do they go into guilds, who's talking to whom, what are they doing, are they forming factions and so on. For a social scientist, this is wonderful. This is as if we had CCTV cameras everywhere in London and could track your every move and say who did what with whom for how long and so on. So a wonderful source. One way to see that, uh, and this argument has been made by many, is to simply say, well, it's all online. I mean, anyone can come in there, anyone can observe you, anyone can watch what you're doing. It's all on the web. It's all public. But from a researcher point of view, I face certain quandaries, because I think if I can look at certain forms of behavior, and if I, let's say, publish about them, then I may be revealing, even if I do it inadvertently, somebody's identity. When I went into a church and I studied what people were doing in that particular church, they were having service, they were praying together and so on. And certain people were saying, well, actually, I'd like to confess to the convocation of avatars. You know, I did this, I might have committed adultery, I might have been doing certain things that you know, I wouldn't confess to my family in real life, but here I am in, in the virtual church confessing it. And yes, it's all there, it's public, it's on the web. Should I as a researcher divulge it? This comes back to contextual integrity, I think. Or is that a particular context which is there for praying or in the case of Second Life for special interest groups to 
uh, get together and have certain discussions about things that may be sensitive in one context but not in another. These are, uh, again, cases where the internet raises certain new things and I think what brings us new ethical dilemmas and I think there are now ways in which we can find out what people are searching for and we as searchers may not be aware precisely of just how anonymous or not anonymous that my searches are. Researchers or companies or others are watching and they're watching in a kind of Orwellian uh, space almost. Often engineers are intrigued by kind of rivaling values that, uh, that are difficult to reconcile. You want to do the one thing and you want to do the other thing uh, but you can't do both. Um, well, sometimes designing uh, something allows you to do both, right? I want to walk outside, have some physical exercise, that's one thing, and I want to stay dry, uh, but it's raining, so I can't do both. Well, the invention of the umbrella is, is, is a way of transforming the world uh, by means of engineering or invention that allows me to solve a problem that I used to have which seemed to be, you know, unsurpassable. It's, it's a conflict. And an engineering solution, and Luciano said, was a technical fix, and if you tell this to philosophers, they will say, oh, this is not a solution of your moral problem. This is a mere technical fix. Well, I don't think so. And I think that many of the problems that we're discussing here are of that nature, that actually they're amenable to engineering solutions in the sense that they transform the world in such a way that we can have our cake and eat it. The CCTV camera is a good example. You're struggling with a kind of first generation stupid camera system which gives you kind of uh, uh, blurred images of the crooks and razor sharp images of the, of the innocent citizens. Or you have a second generation camera system which is better. You put it up everywhere and you have a lot of security but no privacy or you decide not to put it up uh, and you have a lot of privacy but no security. You want your third generation camera system, a really smart camera system which, which does exactly allow you to combine privacy above a certain threshold level and security above a certain threshold level in your area of ideal solutions. Many innovations are like that. You have a good example outside IT, but a very convincing one is you want productivity and economic growth and you want sustainability. Um, unfortunately, you can't do both. But for example, the Germans had in, uh, in the 60s and 70s had this debate squarely on the table. You remember probably those images of the Green Party members who kind of chained themselves to this and that factory. But they had to deal with that tension between this economic growth and productivity growth and sustainability. And therefore, they are now market leaders in sustainability technology. Why is that? Not because they disregarded that, that problem, but they had to deal with it because it's squarely on the table. And that is the motor, if you want, a moral motor for innovation. The third generation smart camera system allows you to, to tweak it and to have your cake and eat it exactly because it has fine granularity. It's advanced technology that allows you to, 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 to uh, configure it in such a way that you can have the functionality that the technology offers without the drawbacks. You can only reach that at a certain level of granularity of the technology which allows you to configure it. You know, ethicists would say this is a technical fix. I, I, I think that some of the solutions are, are there. You're supposed to work out what the consequences will be to the best of your knowledge. You're supposed to work out whether your principle is universalizable. These are kind of mental computations you're supposed to do. And of course, moral behavior, ethical behavior isn't really like that in the sense that there isn't really time to do these computations. I mean, there's something fishy about these theories. The, the social norms, almost the politeness theories, they seem to me to rest on sort of some sort of conditioning and training and what kind of character you, you've been trained or trained yourself to be. Um, what could be done? Could there be training sessions in instant reaction? Should schools give sort of anger management sessions for the internet, for handling the internet to children? I don't know. It's a possibility. Should we explain to them, people have raised this question already today, should we explain the technology of anonymity to them more clearly than we do? No, we just say, well, Google knows who you are. Maybe we should show them more detail. Uh, that they're not anonymous in the way they think they are. I'm sure school teachers do this already. I don't think I'm being very original here. The thing that hasn't come up today 
is the question of, of the way in which the internet lowers the social cost of, of morally questionable behavior. Failed over server hosting and all of that stuff was all driven initially by the demands of the porno websites because they were pushing higher bandwidth than anybody else way before anybody else was pushing high bandwidth. But I think the more interesting question that arises from this is the lowering of cost for the participation in, pick your favorite social ill, pornography, violence, uh, know-nothing extremism of any sort, religious, political, uh, ins you know, insane, in whatever dimension, right? We've made it easy for people to do this in the privacy of their own home with no social context, with no physical human interactions involved, not just facial human interactions, but with no one knowing that they're doing it. And we are, you know, those of us who are not saints get our good behavior in no small part because we're observed, it seems to me. I mean, speaking personally, right? I recognize that this has decreased the, the gap between temptation and action. And that's directly down to the net and its properties. At a time when the sort of ethical basis that we're getting from social, social context, history, school, parents, whatever, is attenuated anyway, as is widely discussed, but nothing specific to do with the net. But you take that general lowering of the efficacy of, of moral tuition, if you will, and you add in the fact that the net makes it easier to sin, to just bumble it all up there, that seems to me to be something we really need to worry about. Let's not forget that the, that the internet also is a, provides greater access at low cost to lots and lots of other things, which are good. And um, I, can you have one without the other? The idea that I have a social identity, my identity is that I belong to X group. I may never, ever, ever have the opportunity to meet anybody else of that group or to be observed by anybody else of that group. And so if my identity, if, if my, my driver of self-development is to buy kittens with Santa Claus outfits because I want to be like the people who buy kittens with Santa Claus outfits, then it has absolutely nothing to do with whether anybody can see, whether Amazon can identify the fact that I have bought kittens with Amazon outfits. And so by, by ignoring that other perceived other, then, then you're undermining the, 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 the agency of the human being. I think you and Mike are, are both pushing back in, in ways that I, uh, I endorse, right? The question is, can we get the, can we get the benefits without the disbenefits? Because it seems to me the disbenefits are very real. Um, and we all enjoy the benefits, but we're paying quite a high price.